In 2011, um, President Obama issued the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace. Our office has always said if nobody knows the term NSTIC, but we're um, using multi-factor credentials, there's a robust, vibrant marketplace of commercial credentials, federated identity is rapid, we'd be very happy. Um, so 2011, this, this thing was issued, um, and it's demonstrative of, of really this administration's perspective uh, on the importance of identity and the importance of um, a global interoperable set of identity standards, methodologies, um, technologies, uh, et cetera, due to the positive economic and cybersecurity impact that good identity management has. Um, so it is now uh, the goal uh, was to deploy identity solutions that were privacy enhancing, secure and resilient, interoperable, cost effective and easy to use. And we spent a long, long time in the back office coming up with these, um, these goals, these um, guiding principles. It was not just a cybersecurity strategy for the sake of cybersecurity. We were very, very um, uh, interested and, and uh, motivated to look not just to the security side of it, but the economic side, uh, the privacy side for sure, um, and, and um, the ease of use for citizens. Because as we've seen, and one thing that I say a lot is, is a bad solution, uh, its biggest threat is the lack of usability. And, and often we don't measure usability as a, as a threat. So um, how did this one get in here? Oops, <laughs> I, I didn't delete this. This was uh, another speech I gave where, um, you know, we, we have just now as a federal government started rec <clears throat> to recognize the role of identity in cybersecurity. And I found this, I've always said for the past 10 years, identity should be treated as a first class citizen as it relates to business processes, as it relates to um, efficiency, and as it relates to um, uh, cybersecurity, and I found this definition in programming and said, look, why are we not doing the exact same thing for identity? And I'm, I'm very happy to say that at this point in time, it looks like our resources are being put more towards identity. Identity, and this is not my phrase, I, I think it's trademark, but identity really is the new perimeter. Um, you know, it doesn't matter, cloud, distribution, those are just somebody other's computers. Identity is the key linchpin, I think, to securing um, uh, our, our key citizens and our our citizens, sorry, our key systems and key data. Um, so the model of the um, of the NSTIC was to convene the private sector. We set up a 5013C, a uh, significant amount of uh, private sector companies uh, lead that. Um, it is not government run, NIST is a, is a peer in that organization, or I'd actually say the US government is a peer in that organization. NIST has a uh, pretty much a backseat role. Uh, Postal Service uh, sits as the the delegate for the US government. Um, and they released a, a framework in October of 2015, which basically lays out the, the rules and the tools and the good practices that we'd like to see from good citizens that are doing identity management in the private sector. Um, we uh, are focused on catalyzing the marketplace. Our budget in my office is primarily spent on grants. Uh, we pilot, uh, we issue federal funding opportunities every year. Uh, spend about 10 million a year on those grants. And as a result, we now have 18 that are live and we have another round that is um, about to get awarded. Um, the result of that is 3.8 million users impacted. And these are pilots that are private sector centric. We actually, um, even though we, we um, don't have it necessarily in our evaluation criteria, but if the, if the market is just federal users, we tend to um, turn those down. Um, we are looking at um, how we can get better security, better tools into the hands of the um, everyday um, citizen, because that's really where we see the economic impact occurring. Um, 11 industries and 10 multi-factor authentication solutions. We're not just looking at authentication. There's a wide spectrum of things in the identity space. We're looking at innovative ways to do identity proofing um, that weren't possible before, innovative ways to use biometrics, privacy-enhancing technologies, um, 
And then we are also in the attribute space. Folks get us confused and think we just do authentication. We really are in the authorization business because it's about delivering trusted attributes as well. Um, what we're not doing is setting authorization policy. That's a local decision. Um, and then the government is an early adopter. Um, Connect.gov uh, is in pilot right now. It had baked in privacy enhancing technologies. It was critical to us to do pri don't ha not hand wave at privacy, not put things in policy, not put things in government governance, but to actually put things in tech deploy technology. And this was pretty ambitious and required um, pretty significant engineering and, and um, innovative use to use cryptography and, and other types of tools. Um, and as a result, you know, we have a system here that we are very proud of that um, in, in this day and age when we have some of the breaches that we've had and when we have some of the government um, surveillance issues that we've had, you know, we can actually say that we're out there not only protecting the citizen but protecting government and product, protecting the private sector because none of these transactions are linkable. So the government it does not know that it's necessarily interacting with Google. Google doesn't know it's interacting with IRS. It knows it's with the government and none of that activity can be tracked so the user is protected from any type of profiling. Um, and it's transitioning now. Uh, into IOC, there'll be an announcement, I believe, um, any day now, uh, where GSA will be rolling that out from um, a, a small pilot to a, a more robust um, production-based system for uh, the whole of government as a shared service. We originally had this slide as a just a typical timeline, and I thought the uh, Gartner hype cycle was um, a little bit more apropos, and I tweak some of the some of the terms terms here. But we have definitely ridden that hype cycle wave. Uh, Instic came out, and it was an immediate fervor in in both the private sector and internationally. We were uh, <clears throat> the darlings, if you will, of identity for for a while there. A lot of folks saying, "Hey, if we're gonna if you're gonna build a, a national strategy, this is the way to do it," and we had uh, a significant amount of buy-in at the onset. Um, well, it was four years ago, five years ago, now, um, and we've we've um, come out of that that excitement, and we actually bottomed out. I would say about a year ago, the uh, organization that we were working with had kind of um, lost its footing. And you know, everyone was wondering, okay, are we gonna have to redo this again for the fifth or sixth time? Because uh, that's about how many times we in the government have tried to figure out identity. Well, we came out of that. The, the IDSG um, absolutely answered the mail, put out the IDEF, and the private sector has been doing incredible things with multi-factor authentication. So we're coming out of the, uh, the what, what do they call it, the trough of disillusionment. I'm calling it the let's get the hell out of here. And we've actually, um, we, we know this is real, we believe in it, and we think that there's gonna be only more success to come. But we are certainly not even close to done, and this is just a quote out of there. Um, the green is what we've actually implemented um, today with the private sector, and this is the first framework of its kind. We've got in, in the market, uh, globally, and in the US, um, these little, frameworks that are community-centric. This is the first one that is holistic and looks at, uh, is community agnostic and really looks at privacy, security, interoperability, usability, holistically into a set of rules that uh, we think folks will be able to self-attest to in the very near term. So the IDEF, like I've said, it's, it is a, a set of requirements, it's a set of guidelines, um, it is a roadmap and there is also a self-attestation self um, piece to it as well. So what we uh, expect to see over time is a registry of entities that can self-attest and say, I'm a good player in this space. And then ultimately that would give um, businesses and individuals the ability to choose um, the provider they wanna use based on not only their self-attestation, self but additional um, value add that they may provide. These are just a, a snapshot of a few of the companies that, that we're dealing with in our pilots that have self-attested to this uh, framework. Um, and there are pretty significant names in here, um, as well as some uh, interesting startups that we're dealing with. The bottom right G, that's Galois. They're doing IoT for us. They're looking at privacy enhancing IoT. They're looking at the security of IoT. Um, and, and given where the IoT market is today with very little security, um, we're thrilled to have them on board. 
But mission not yet accomplished. Um, we would like to think we are there, but we're not. Um, my friend, Dr. Osmond from DHS, this quote says it all. I won't flash up a bunch of uh, breach statistics, but almost every major breach this year and in years past had to do with credentials that were compromised. And in this case, while everyone's arguing that if this data was encrypted, we would have been protected and all this information wouldn't be out there in the mass market to use against us, the reality is it was encrypted. The person that got access to it had legitimate credentials to decrypt the said data, and that was a username and password. So the other problem, and this is more of an economic issue with today's market, all right, we used to have this, too many passwords. That's, we know that that's bad, and we, we know we're working away out of that. Now we have this. I have a ton of passwords, and I also have every single one of these second factors. And they're not all on the same device. And not only do I have all these second factors, I also have these amazing recovery codes, which are just as bad, I think, as a password. So what's happening as a result? I used to be able to remember my password and log in to do business. Now, if I want to conduct business online and my phone is upstairs, I bail out. I do not, I'm lazy, I don't go upstairs, I don't get my phone. Um, I forget which phone uh, the text message is going to. It may go to my wife, it may go to me. So we've got a little bit of an issue. We've created a monster that we didn't expect we'd create. It's a secure monster, but um, the economic impacts, the usability impacts are pretty significant. Um, so we're, we're now focusing on of many, of many things. This is one of the areas where we need to um, work with the market and work with the user community to get away from this you know, necklace, token necklace, if you will, of, of private sector second factors. We must accelerate adoption. We've done a great job um, getting users, or I'm sorry, um, low risk, um, highly visible assets protected with two-factor, Google, um, LinkedIn, Facebook, um, but my bank still doesn't do two-factor, mine doesn't. Um, so we need to accelerate that adoption and we need users um, to move beyond just the demand for second factor, but look at um, federation. The previous slide of having all of these second factors is unacceptable. Um, I consider myself a power user. I can sort of handle it. I don't think my mother or father can. So how do we make this um, a much easier world for them to live in while giving them the, the benefits of, of secure two-factor? So this is our new model as we move forward. Um, NSTIC was a startup. Uh, we got a, a, I'd call it a dose of reality that we knew it was coming at RSA this year. We had the NSTIC document out on the NIST table. And a lot of people came up, what's this? 2011, this is really old, and they'd put it down. And the fact is, it is old, but still relevant. So we are now moving out of startup and into a sustainment model and looking at all of these elements to continue to drive um, a vibrant market of secure credentials, secure identities, secure attributes. This administration is gonna go away. Uh, we are not. Um, so this is just part of our, our natural evolution um, as, as civil servants. So a few things that we're doing. Um, I, I was always kind of dubious on, on outreach and engagement and I've completely flipped after coming to the government. Um, this is one of our strengths and one of our biggest assets and biggest tools <clears throat> and has really um, helped drive awareness of, of what's important. Uh, and we're gonna be doing a lot more public outreach here in the near future um, and more of a, a tutorial-based um, 101 kind of um, set of blogs and, and online social media events to um, continue to interact with, with the citizenship. Um, fostering more partnerships. Um, we absolutely um, believe that we are not, nothing can be US-centric. Nothing can be government-centric, that this is truly global. Um, and when you look at some of the use cases that are coming down the pike, uh, global interoperability when it comes down to identity is, is essential. Even just silly things like, well, not silly, but um, you know, our, our foreign partners, when they fly to the US, have to go to DHS and fill out a form. 
saying they're coming into the, into the country. We envision a world where their trusted identity uh, issued by their home country or by private sector entities in their home country could be used to actually access that system and provide trusted attributes so users aren't uh, filling that data in themselves, creating data integrity issues. And hey, if these people are uh, using trusted identities that are interoperable and globally recognized, maybe, and, and I can't answer this for DHS, but I certainly think we've got something here, maybe the risk profile of that person can go down and DHS cannot spend a lot of time um, investigating them as they're traveling into the US. We've got a lot of that um, when it comes to foreign travel and foreign partners. Um, really big critical as, uh, element to us is measurement science and market intelligence. Um, we are going to do things because it's based on need, not wants, not um, something that we think is a good idea. We will be pinging the market and doing a significant amount of market outreach. Um, when folks come to me and say, uh, you know, I'm a comp sci major, I've been doing cybersecurity for X amount of time, is there a position for me? Um, of course there is, but we're actually hiring more economists and, and uh, communications and policy folks to be able to get this market intelligence and metrics development right. Um, and then we can build the, the guidance to, to meet those metrics. And then of course, uh, our bread and butter is guidance and, and publications seeking US global and indus industry alignment. Um, I've maintained, and at least in the portfolio of, of special pubs and, and guidelines that, that I have, um, that we should default to international first, not write a special pub because we think we're special. The only reason why I would write a special publication is because we can get there faster, believe it or not, than, than it may be, be able to in the international community. But when we do that, it's got a roadmap to international standards bodies. This is a, a snapshot of some of the elements we're looking at, um, a lot of uh, standards activity, a significant amount of privacy risk management. We're getting away from um, privacy as a, a policy element and looking at privacy technology, privacy enhancing technology. How can we move the market in that aspect? Uh, significant amount of pilots. Um, 863 is, is the um, e-authentication guideline. We are in a major revision of that that I'll talk about and it is um, going to be aligned with uh, this is GPG, Good Practice Guide, that's, that's UK's document, but essentially we're gonna internationally align that. Um, strength of IDM frameworks, that's where I'll spend most of my time moving forward, is, is getting away from kind of the soft side of identity. It feels right if you do X, it feels right if you do Y, based on um, uh, what we think is, is the threats that we're mitigating. Uh, we're actually looking to apply measurement science to that, we are NIST, after all, so the more measurement we can apply to identity, the better we can um, help organizations make risk-based decisions based on those, those measurements. We want to be able to um, help entities uh, make good business decisions based on risk by giving them, uh, I'll say it's a nebulous score because we haven't built the framework yet, but, but giving them the ability to score um, various identity um, technologies and processes. So this is where I'll get into the, um, the, the projects we're taking on right now that we think are gonna have the most impact um, in the identity space. And I, I should say, that when it comes to identity, there's, there's obviously it's a very, very big space. The PIV card, um, that is not what we're focused on. There's an excellent group at NIST doing that. We, we obviously feel very strongly that the PIV card is, is an amazing technology and it's kind of the gold standard of security maybe not of usability, um, but we're working through that. Um, and we're actually working with um, OMB to, you know, maybe we can use these PIV cards to interact with the private sector if they would, um, you know, stand up a service that let us log in with them, but there's some policy related to that. So, um, any, anybody aware of 863? Okay, good, then this would be potentially helpful. So we've, um, it's been around for about 10 years. Um, it, it's been a pretty influential document in, in the international arena, um, but it's, it's stale. And, and that's not a, a, a knock on, on the draft or, or, the, or the authors. It's lived for over 10 years, which I think is pretty darn impressive for a technology document. 
um, but it is style. So we're taking on a pretty significant revision. I'm actually doing more deleting than we are writing, which, which feels really good. Um, so levels of assurance today are comprised of um, uh, identity proofing and credential strength. And there's, depending on your implementation, there's some other elements. But for the most part, those are the two big, big parts. Um, and they are inextricably linked. If I want to give somebody a two-factor credential in the government, then I have to identity proof them with uh, high confidence. I need to collect all this personal information about them. Um, I need to store all that personal information. And, and God knows uh, we don't need to be storing any more personal information, let alone storing it um, n times, one per agency that needs to do this. Um, so we've separated the two. Agencies can now cherry pick um, the type of authenticator they want to use or credential they want to use and the level of identity proofing that they want. And the asterisk is there because this is an OMB decision, not a NIST decision. Um, they, they need to be the ones that says this is the new uh, LOA scheme, but we're going forward as if this is going to happen. And if they, they don't make that change, then we've got ways to accomplish this, but stay within the, the current four level scheme. So what this really means is um, two things. We uh, are going to put a two factor, a two factors right in the sweet spot of this. Um, and so is um, privacy enhancing. Um, identity proofing. The goal here is to no longer collect information um, if you don't need it. It's to get claims about somebody. Are they older than 21? Yes or no? That's the only thing I need to know. Why the heck would I proof them and have all that other data? Uh, the other thing this allows us to do is to have strong um, credentials with no identity. So if you imagine a, a HHS system, maybe they, they're throwing up some sort of health tracker where you know I can link my Fitbit into there or my heart rate. Uh, that's sensitive data that needs to be protected and should be protected with two-factor, but there's no reason why HHS needs to know that that's me. None. So we've, this, this gives us that ability. Um, what it also does, and it's not really written here, is um, there's, there's two, four levels of assurance. We're getting rid of one. Level two um, is proofing like level three and credentialing like level one, and we think that's broken. Um, and then not to punish agencies, but we think, uh, and, and we're not regulatory, and nor do we audit, but um, in my private sector experience as a consultant, I think agencies say they're level three, but then pick level two, because it's cheaper, it's just a password. Um, so again, not a punishment, but we're getting rid of it. So now if you have any type of system that has any type of uh, sensitive data, it will be uh, level two. Um, and two-factor. Level one remains because <clears throat> anonymous and um, password-based makes sense for some services government's doing. Yes, um, not in this document, but yes, so that, I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, multiple volumes, this is a usability thing. Now that we've broken things up, um, we think you know agencies that care about proofing can only go to the proofing chapter. Um, this is, is kind of nerdy, but um, we're, we're taking a new approach. Usually, we, we take our documents and we go in the office for a year, write them, put them out for 30 days, collect comments, go back for another six months, and then release the final. Um, it's, it's open. It's as transparent as, as we, we need to be. But it, it's for a document like 63, which really is, even though it's targeted at the government, has a private sector impact, we decided we want to do this in public. So we're actually going to do this on GitHub. We're going to iterate it on, on it starting in May. So every change will be done in public. Every comment will be adjudicated in public. And we'll even be accepting private sector contributions. Um, I should say that a different way. We will allow private sector contribution and then we can accept or reject them. But GitHub gives us that ability to do that, and it's, it's a much more um, common approach in standards development and one that we're really excited about. So some of the meat, we're rewriting identity proofing. We've aligned it with UK and Canada right now. For those that have seen some of the news about um, the IRS, um, remote identity proofing has failed us. Um, and knowledge-based authentication, which is what most remote proofing is based on, has failed us. And uh, the fact that all of our data is in the wild, and that's a fact, why are we still proofing that way? So this rewrite will um, 
will set the record straight on what can be done with KBA and what cannot be done with it, and allows for a significant more, uh, amount of innovation as it relates to remote identity proofing. So we envision uh, providers that have <clears throat> remote capabilities to scan documents using the camera on your phone or the camera on your computer. Um, we've seen in the UK significant fraud um, be thwarted because of that. We, we've got a pilot right now that we're funding that um, does a biometric match with your data bit, with your photo in the DMV database. So we see people proofing that way as well. Um, and we're even getting to the point where we think, and this is the fun part about doing it in public, we can be aggressive at the beginning and then let the comment period settle us down. We think we can even do uh, virtual in-person proofing for the high levels of assurance instead of the um, come in person and do something. Technology has demonstrated to us that in-person proofing with somebody that's just visually inspecting is inadequate. We can do a lot more um, detection of, of fraud with um, machines involved, but there are, there's gonna be some pretty stringent rules there because in-person is still valuable. Um, added significant privacy requirements. Um, again, identity um, when done well can be very privacy enriching, but it can also be, um, as we were talking about earlier, a honeypot, it can be a pretty sensitive um, treasure trove of data if used and Im implemented the wrong way. So we're creating um, actual normative shall do this uh, requirements on privacy. Um, user experience, uh, we're adding that. Same thing I, I mentioned earlier, um, we look at threats to a system and we come up with mitigations. I think bad UX is a threat. Um, so we're making sure that we look at um, the UX implications of the processes and technologies that we're putting out there. So we don't want to inadvertently create a bad, you know, specify a bad or a strong technology that has poor user experience that ultimately has some work around that de degrades it even more. And if we choose a secure solution that has bad usability and no workaround, but we still pick it, we at least have done our homework on the UX side, uh, the UX benefits or, or, or lack thereof um, balanced with, with the security side. And then um, a more robust uh, inclusion for, for biometrics, 63 right now is, is pretty, um, uh, I'd say, um, not biometric friendly. And, and we are, because of what we're seeing in the consumer market, we are um, adding a lot more um, biometric requirements, um, but not at the sake of, of privacy and security. There still will be requirements um, that must be met if you want to do server-side uh, matching of biometrics. So some of the other things we're doing, um, this is the measurement science piece. Um, we are looking at strength of identity proofing, credentials, and attributes, as you mentioned. Um, these will ultimately feed into 63, but not in this draft. So on the identity proofing side, um, uh, this is the, the typical process. Uh, the first thing that has to happen is you have to resolve to a unique uh, record. Proofing is not done at that point. You just um, know, or you know or believe you're working with Paul. Um, validation is, am I giving, is the information correct? Is it not fraudulent? Is it authentic? And then verification is, is it actually is the data I'm presenting actually for me. Um, the example use case I give is something that use, the post office is doing today. They have an in-person proofing um, pilot. Um, they're actually sending mail carriers to your home if you want to get in-person proofed, it's pretty cool. Um, and, and they allow a few different forms of ID. One is a driver's license and one is a passport. If you give them a driver's license, they have a mobile device and they scan the driver's license. They can read the barcode. They can match that up with the data. They can do some of the checksums um, with the ID numbers. They can look at some of the physical security uh, features of the driver's license. Um, and then if it's, of course, you and everything works out, they'll give you a, a credential. If you give them a passport, they look at it. They can't do any electronic scanning with that. But it's considered the same exact proof. I would argue that's much weaker. Or I would at least argue that if you're a relying party that has an identity coming to your system, you should know how they were proofed. And you should know that person X did it with a passport that was visually inspected, and person Y did it with a, with a real ID that was you know, all sorts of electronic scans. So we're looking at how we can score this. Again, not to 
um, give away too much information, but to allow uh, agencies and private sector entities to make an appropriate risk-based decision. Um, strength of authentication, this is a pretty busy chart. Uh, the first thing we're focusing on is biometrics um, for two reasons. One, we can't ignore what's going on in the consumer marketplace. If we sat here and said, um, we're gonna ignore biometrics and we're gonna focus on um, you know, RSA fobs, we would be fouling um, the majority of the US population and, and economy. Um, these mobile devices aren't going away. Um, ask, uh, ask your bank, the reason they're adopting it is not because they feel good about the security, it's because your users are demanding it. So we want them to feel good about the security. So we're looking at an end-to-end -end, uh, system from a biometric perspective and we'll start scoring it. Um, so this is everything from is presentation attack detection implemented, meaning can I beat this, the system with a gummy bear um, with a fingerprint on it, all the way down, is it easy to manipulate the, the, the decision? If, if the, the matching engine says yes and I can flick, or actually says false and I can flick that to true, there's a vulnerability there. And we're looking at it as a system of systems. So it's not just the sensor on the phone, it's the end-to-end -end system. If it's an Apple, everything's located on the device itself, so we'll, we'll measure just that device. If it's, if it's a Apple uh, device that's doing some sort of central match, then we've gotta look at everything. And then this is the attribute um, assurance. We're not calling it assurance yet. We don't know what to call it. Assurance is loaded, confidence is loaded, trustworthiness is loaded. But again, we want to be able to give um, agencies and consumers of attributes uh, more information than just the value. How do I know where that value was derived from? Who, what was the authoritative source? Where has it been in its life cycle? Um, and again, all this metadata is optional, uh, nothing mandatory, but it gives the agency the ability to um, dig deeper into that attribute value and again, make a risk-based decision. Yes, I trust this, no, I don't. Um, and, and we're quickly um, getting beyond just um, kind of the security side of the attribute and the trustiness and truthiness of the attribute and starting to get into things like acceptable use. Is there a privacy um, constraint here? Should you um, destroy this attribute the second you use it? Um, should you save this? Are you allowed to save it? For how long? So it's expanding into a pretty neat um, set of, of, of metadata tags. And uh, by the way, all these are um, efforts that are also going on in GitHub. So all these are being done publicly as well. And I'll have links for you later. And I think this is one of the last ones. Um, I mentioned earlier our um, international um, goals. Um, in the past with government identity, we went into the bowels of GSA. We came up with profiles of identity standards because we thought we were the smartest. And then we deployed it and not a single private sector company could implement it, nor could an agency, nor could any of our partners. And what did we do? We forced them to do it. Um, and we now have, in, in the spirit of interoperability, have none. So um, we've taken a different approach um, with some of the new prof or new standards that are out there. Rather than go and do this on our own because we think we're special, we're doing it in an international standards committee. So it's Open ID Foundation. iGov is is the name of the work group. Um, it's for Open ID Connect, which is a much more developer friendly uh, identity assertion language, um, and we have 15 or 16 countries. Um, from every continent, uh, UK is chair, US is chair, and um, we've actually got a private sector company that's chair as well. So maybe you could just sort of provide your perspective on how we're doing with FedRAMP. There are also significant challenges where companies have certified products, but those products are out of date because if they try to update them, they will fall out of compliance. Yeah, I mean, FedRAMP's not mine in my portfolio, so I can't really comment on that, but. Um, I hear the frustration, um, and, and I know that they're doing a significant overhaul um, with, with FedRAMP to, I think, address a lot of that. Um, but we have the same challenges on, on the identity side, right? Everyone um, wants to do their own thing for some reason, and they won't accept someone else's. Um, and and it, 
it's rarely, in my experience, the technology. Um, it's not that my shiny object is shinier than yours. It's we don't have a good business model and we don't have a good liability model. Um, and that's part of the reason why we're doing the market intelligence that we're doing and the user studies um, is in the business case development is so that we can actually create a um, service, set of services that are actually in um, economically um, beneficial to agencies to implement so they don't have to do it themselves. So real quick, um, what's next? Because I'm running out of time. Um, like I said, our, our framework um, was really just kind of a, a, a bare bones, minimal set of requirements. The, the element of risk wasn't applied. Uh, we now need to do that. And again, the president asked us to do this in the strategy in 2011. He knew that the first step was going to be that baseline set, but that we needed to progress to um, a risk-based framework. So that's definitely uh, next on the hopper with our private sector entities. Um, there's some interesting things that will happen as a result. Um, we'll have uh, registries of providers that are uh, meet these requirements. Um, we'll have potentially trust marks, which would be machine-readable um, policy statements, if you will. Um, so instead of having to um, read your security, privacy policies, we can assert them through trust marks and do a delta and, and get policy interoperability um, in near real time if this gets deployed the right way. Um, the nice thing about this trust mark approach is now we can have dynamic discovery. So if you're an agency um, or a private sector entity that covets uh, you know, privacy requirement X, Y, Z, you can query X, Y, Z and find all the element or all the providers that adhere to that um, and on the registration side too. And then what I think is the coolest and, and we're working with um, the Mozilla's of the world on this is sort of like the equivalent of the, the green bar in the browser. So the one that tells you you're using SSL or TLS. Um, in this case, once we have this vibrant marketplace of credentials, which we don't have yet, like I said, we're not, not done yet, we do envision a day where if I'm logging in with my Verizon ID um, and I'm going to um, a site like Amazon, that browser will be able to pop up um, the elements of uh, Amazon's policy that doesn't match the policies of the credential that I chose. I chose this credential that because I value this privacy requirement or I value this security requirement and this browser pop-up would basically demonstrate that Amazon doesn't follow something. And then I can make an educated decision uh, about whether I want to proceed as opposed to just click through some um, policy that I'm never going to read. Um, but that's way off. So this is what we think. We've always said it's a 10-year run. We're through year five. Um, we see 2021 as our uh, sunset date, um, but certainly work will, will continue from there on. I think that's it. So these are some of the links. You guys can have these. And that's it. Questions? I think I hit 1030. Yeah, Paul, I've got a question. Um, since you just mentioned Amazon, uh, what's NIST's? feelings on uh, the kind of personal information that Google gathers with their special sauce algorithms <coughs> um, where it sort of uh, breaks the privacy code and they're able to collect anything they want from, uh, from the users. Uh, does NIST have feelings on that? that? Is that something that you want to also move to where the credentials uh, would be more trusted at some point where they can't do that? Or would that put them out of business? Well, we're certainly not in the in the business of putting people out of business, and I don't think we could ever do that to Google. We don't have a, a, a position, if you will, on, on Google's uh, approach. Uh, Google's a good partner of ours, um, and we spend a lot of time working with them. And I actually think when it comes to um, um, at least your security online, they, they are doing a lot of really, really good things. But, but they're, you're the product. Um, and, and you know, from an identity perspective, we've actually asked them, hey, we want to know um, if this person's got two-factor turned on or not. We want to uh, we want to log them out so we can you know have some trust in their in in session state. And, and their answer to us is, hell no, we don't log anyone out. Um, 
But we, we envision a day where um, certainly you're a little bit more informed, a lot more informed about what Google's doing under the hood, um, and you make that decision for yourself. Um, but we're, we're certainly a ways away from that. Um, so where, where have you guys come down from FIDO? Um, we are members. So FIDO, um, about a year or two ago, opened up a um, government class, and the UK and the US were the first two to join. If there are any feds in the room, um, because of our membership, you are now a member. Um, that's a little known fact. Um, so if you want to participate, let me know. Um, you know, FIDO, we think are doing, they're doing great things. And we're, uh, you know, that biometric work I mentioned is um, being done with the FIDOs of the world in mind because they need to be able to, you know, they have authenticators that are based on many different flavors, some of them being biometric. And they want to be able to assert in their metadata to relying parties uh, what is been, what is happening, what is, what's the security of, of this uh, biometric, what's the um, um, security of the authenticator. So doing great things, they're, um, but they're only one part of the puzzle, right? They're looking at authentication only. They have, um, Brett would kill me, but I always say punted. They've punted on identity. That's the hard part. Um, but you know, in terms of what they're doing to put two-factor authentication on consumer devices um, and now moving their specs into W3C so they can implement it in the browser, uh, that's all goodness. Um, NIAP is developing, oh, thank you. NIAP is developing a, a mobile device management protection profile, which is encompassing passwords, biometrics, and other aspects. How close does, would NIST work with NIAP in that sort of a situation? I, I see you moving 863 more towards uh, biometric friendliness, and that's a great thing. Just wondered how you might be looking to um, uh, work with NIAP in that. Not unlike any organization, <coughs> we're very large and, and sometimes stovepipe, so I'm not sure if we don't already work with, with NIAP, we, we may. And there's some really good mobile people that would if they're not already. Um, me, I definitely would. Uh, the, the things that we're doing in, in the strength of space, we want to inform all sorts of, of profiles and specifications and good practices. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons, you know, 863 is just one reason. We, we would like to get to a day where we can say at level two, the only authenticators that are allowed score X to Y, as opposed to just this box of, all right, if the key length is this long or the entropy is that, or the, you know, if it's two factors versus one, um, and, and the same with the biometrics. So to the extent we can inform and be informed, we're all for it. Uh, 